Think of how much you've learned so far. You already know translations left, right, up, down. It's really awesome because these rules that we're talking about are going to apply to all of our parent functions that we get to this year. So next, let's look at the general form equation for our absolute value parent function with transformations. We have y equals a absolute value x minus h absolute value plus k. Well, what does each of those variables stand for? A is our dilation, and we haven't looked at that yet, but we're about to. So let's write these down. A gives us our vertical stretch or compression. It's always a positive value. You'll know why I say that coming up in a few. The other thing I want you to know is that we are multiplying by that A value, so we always refer to it as a factor. Factor, factor, factor. You should remember us telling you about factors before. Next, let's take a look at the H. Well, H is inside with the X. Inside with the X. What did we find out about that? Inside was opposite. H had a movement of left, right. So that was our horizontal translation. Horizontal translation, inside, opposite, meaning the opposite sign. And last, K. Well, we've seen above that K moves it up and down. So that's our vertical translation. And remember, outside, same. Remember I said A is your vertical stretch or compression, and it's a factor, and we always have it positive. Well, if it happens to be negative, it doesn't mean we have a negative factor. The negative means something else. It actually means we have reflected. So that's where we get our reflection across the horizontal or vertical axis. Remember that, we'll have some examples coming up soon. Another connection we can make is what's our vertex just looking at that equation. H is our horizontal translation, and that of course gives us the X coordinate to our vertex. And then K ends up being our vertical translation, and that ends up giving us our Y coordinate to the vertex. Along with that, where is the axis of symmetry? Well, it's always at that X coordinate of the vertex. So I can go ahead and say X equals H for the axis of symmetry. The other thing we know from the vertex for absolute value graphs is the min and the max. And the min and the max value comes from the Y coordinate. So you haven't seen a max yet, but it's coming up. Last, I mentioned that earlier, our A value is always reported as always positive. And what happens if it happens to have a negative in front of it? It's a reflection. That's why we always report that A is a vertical stretch or compression by a factor of whatever the positive is. And then if there is a negative, we're gonna be talking about how that shows up and what words to use if A happens to be negative. Let's continue graphing absolute value functions. Look at this one, 0 0.5 times the absolute value of X. Well, we know that this 0 0.5 is in the A's position. And remember the A value is a vertical stretch or compression. So you think multiplying by a factor of 0 0.5 is gonna be a vertical stretch or a vertical compression? Well, let's make a table of values to make sure we're on the right track here. So I just chose some generic points, some negative values and some positive values that I'm gonna plug into this function. So 0 0.5 times the absolute value of negative two. Absolute value of negative two is two, so 0 0.5 times two is one. 0 0.5 times the absolute value of negative one. Absolute value of negative one is one. 0 0.5 times one is 0 0.5. Okay, so let's see what happens when we graph these points. Okay, so I plotted those points. What does it look like happen? Does it look like a vertical stretch or does it look like a vertical compression? Here's my parent function right here. Does it look like I stretched this vertically or does it look like I compressed it vertically? It's looking like a compression to me. It kind of looks like it got squished. So here's my V and it got squished down. So it gets a little wider. So what did that do to my pattern points? If I were to start at that vertex zero, zero, instead of going up one, over one, now I'm going up one over two, it looks like. So it was a vertical compression by a factor of one half. So let's write our transformation down. My function g of x equals 0 0.5 times the absolute value of x has a vertex of zero, zero, an axis of symmetry at x equals zero because that's the x coordinate of the vertex, a min of zero at x equals zero, a domain of all reals, and a range of y is greater than or equal to zero. Again, that 0 0.5 was that A value, and we figured out that it was a vertical compression by a factor of 0 0.5. So let's try this next one with a five as the A value. So five absolute value of X. I might need to make a table real quick for this one because I'm not sure if that five is gonna be a vertical 
stretch or vertical compression. What do you think it's gonna be? Whoa, I got some big values in my table when I plugged in negative two, one, zero, one, and two. I, when I went to plot, I could only really plot the middle three. I've got my negative one, five, my zero, zero, and my one, five on there. So what looks like happened this time? Here's my parent function. Did I stretch vertically or did I compress vertically? I stretched, I got super tall and skinny. So my V instead of getting wider this time got really tall and skinny. So it was a stretch vertically. So that five this time was a stretch vertically. I wonder if there's a quicker way to realize if it's a vertical stretch or compression without me having to make a table. When it was 0 0.5, it was a vertical compression. When A was five, it was a vertical stretch. So it turns out if A is less than one, like 0 0.5, then it's a vertical compression. If A is bigger than one, then it's a vertical stretch. So let's write that down so we remember this rule. Now remember, Mrs. Pierce said A is always positive. So let's throw some absolute value bars on there just to be safe. So if A is less than one, we know it's a vertical compression. If A is greater than one, we know it's a vertical stretch. So back to the graph. So I've got this tall, skinny looking V right here. Well, what's maybe a quicker way I can look at my pattern points and know without having to make a table every time? Because usually we get the zero, zero on there and then we just go up one over one, up one over one. When A was 0 0.5, if I look at my pattern points, I'm at zero, zero, and then I go up one over two. So 0 0.5 is kind of like one half, so it's almost like I went up one over two, like one over two, one half. So five, is there, does that work here? Like if I start at zero, zero, do I go up five and over one to get this point right here? Let's see, up five over one, up five over one. So I could almost use A to right away adjust my pattern points when I'm drawing a graph. So. We'll try that on the next one in a minute, but let's make sure we get our transformations written here and then fill in what we know about the graph. You get that done and we'll check. Check to see if you're getting that right. I've got my transformations written and then I have my vertex, my min, my domain, and my range identified. So looking at the next one, we have a ton going on with this absolute value, right? We have an A value in the front three and then we have a minus two inside the absolute value bars and a minus four outside. So take a minute, write down all your transformations that you see. Remember to use that academic language. Let's check out your transformations. So I've got the y equals absolute value of x parent function is vertically stretched by a factor of two because a was three and that's greater than one, was translated to the right two because I have this minus two inside, inside opposite, so to the right two, and down four, outside same, so minus four is going to be down. Remember, you can always write your general form right above so that you can match your A to your A, your H to your H, and your K to your K if you need to. Let's get this graphed. First, we always, always, always wanna graph our vertex. So if I'm starting at zero and then I'm shifting, okay, here we go, we're shifting right two and down four. That stretch just multiplies my graph by three, so that doesn't change my vertex's location at all. So I only have to worry about my translations when I'm plotting my vertex. So right two, down four. Once I have my vertex plotted, let's back to those pattern points. So I'm at my vertex. Normally I would go up one over one, up one over one. Do my pattern points change? They definitely do because this graph is being stretched by three. So my pattern points are gonna change by three over one. So it's gonna be okay, up three over one, up three over one to make sure my graph looks vertically stretched. So here's my vertex, up three over one. Does that absolute value graph look like it was vertically stretched? Yeah, it definitely looks kind of tall and skinny. So I know I'm on the right track. Okay, I'm gonna fill in my vertex and all my facts about my graph and we'll check back in. All right, check your facts with my facts. I've got a vertex of two negative four. I've got an axis of symmetry at x equals two because that's the x value of my vertex. I got a minimum of negative four at x equals two, a domain that's all real numbers, and a range that's y is greater than or equal to four. Now, I know you've had to write these a few times and it can get kind of annoying, but we're making you do this for a reason. We actually look to see that you know how to correctly write a vertex. We look to see that you can correctly identify an axis of symmetry. And better yet, we look to see that you are making sure to state your minimum or your maximum correctly, saying minimum of the y value at the x value. We wanna see that. That's why we're having you practice it over and over. Let's keep this rolling. We have this next section with a lot going on as well. We're gonna see how much you can do here, but let's stick together on this first one. We've got g of x equals negative one half times the absolute value of x. 
Hey, take a moment, predict. What do you think a negative one half is gonna do to my absolute value graph? Well, one half, right, if the negative sign wouldn't have been there, is just like this one up here where we had 0.5. So we know that's gonna be a vertical compression because a is less than one, but what's a negative do to a graph? Anytime I multiply a function by a negative, it reflects that graph over the x-axis. Remember we're saying reflects, not flipped, using that academic language. Writing my transformations, I'm gonna identify the negative as a reflection and the one-half as a vertical compression. So it's, I have two separate transformations there for that negative one-half. So y equals absolute value of x is reflected over the y-axis and vertically compressed by a factor of one-half. So really keep your eye out for those negatives. We have to make sure we include a reflection as well as a vertical compression or stretch based on the number we see. Was this graph translated at all? No. So my vertex is just going to be here at 0, 0. That's always where I start before I draw the graph. So I'm at 0, 0. Normally I would go up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, but... I have a negative one half in front of my graph. So instead of going up one, I'm gonna go down one. Instead of going over one, I'm gonna go over two because I have a one half there and better yet, a negative one half. So here I go, down one over two, down one over two, and I could even draw another point just to be safe. So it definitely looks like an upside down V that's been compressed so it's got a, a little bit wider. Whoa. I'm starting to fill in this bottom stuff here, you guys. I got a vertex of zero, zero, no big deal, an axis of symmetry at x equals zero. But wait a minute, the graph flipped upside down, so do, do I still have a minimum, or do I now have a maximum? Look, I don't have a very bottom of this graph anymore because the graph keeps going down forever and ever and ever. So I have a very top this time, which means I have a maximum. So maximum, you can think they look like mountains, where minimums look like valleys. Okay, so I have a maximum of zero at x equals zero. Domain is still all reals because I can see the graph on the entire x-axis. And then the range, oh boy, the range. Let me put my little stick figure on my graph. Can my stick figure see my graph right there? He totally can because there's, the graph's pointed down. So right here, I'm actually seeing the graph. As I walk up to zero, I can see the graph. The second my stick figure pops above zero, I no longer see the graph to the left and right of me. So my range this time is gonna be y is less than or equal to zero instead of greater than or equal to zero because it's everything below zero. So when I write that in interval notation, I'm gonna start at negative infinity because that's actually where I start seeing the graph and travel to zero. So I'm gonna have a parentheses on my negative infinity because we never actually reach negative infinity. Traveling to zero, I do reach the zero, so I put a bracket on my zero. We have now officially learned everything that can happen to these absolute value graphs. Why don't you try these next two and see if you get them graphed correctly and identify all the characteristics of the graph on your own. Okay, let's check on h of x. So this one, y equals absolute value of x has been reflected over the x-axis and vertically stretched by a factor of two, all because of that negative two a value in front of the absolute value bars. Then it was translated to the right because of that inside opposite minus one, so to the right one and up four units because of that plus four outside, outside same. So then when I go and graph it, of course I graph my vertex first. Always graph your vertex first. Once I'm at my vertex, well, can I go up one over one or do my pattern points change? They change because of that A value. So instead of going up one over one, I'm gonna go down two over one because of that negative two. So down two over one, down two over one. So I get that upside down V because it was reflected. And it also looks a little skinny because it was vertically stretched. So my vertex is one, four. My axis of symmetry is X equals one. I have a max this time because it looks like that mountain shape, right? So the tippy top is four at X equals one. The domain is all real numbers. And then I have a range of Y is less than or equal to four because since it's a max, it's everything below that max value for my range. Y is less than or equal to four. Last function, J of X. This one, absolute value of X is reflected over the X axis because of the negative sign vertically compressed. Make sure you said compressed by two, a factor of two thirds, right? Two thirds is less than one, so it's a compression. Translated left two and down three. So that leaves me with a vertex of negative two, negative three. So that makes my axis of symmetry X equals negative two. 
a max of negative three at x equals negative two, and then a domain of all real numbers. And since I have a max, a reflected graph here, my range is everything less than that max value. So negative three or equal to it. My graph, I plotted my vertex first. My pattern points changed because of the negative two thirds that's in front of my absolute value bars. So I went down two over three, down two over three to draw my upside down or my reflected absolute value graph. Now, what if we start kind of like with the answer and we want the question, meaning I have the graph, what's the equation? I'm going to write down the equation just so I keep in mind all of the pieces that I need to have when I write it. So A, absolute value, X minus H plus K. Well, let's take a look. Tracking the vertex, I can tell that it's been translated to the right two and down two. Next, let's see if there's an A value. I know it's not reflected, so I know it won't be negative in front of that. Looks like I would go up one over two, up one over two. So A seems to be a vertical compression by a factor of one half. I kind of know that too, because it's gotten skinnier, right? Vertex is at positive two, negative two. In our dilation, A is a one half and there is no reflection, so my equation is going to be y equals one-half absolute value x minus h, so minus positive two, inside opposite, plus k. Well, in this case, k is a negative, so I'm actually going to write minus two. So inside opposite, outside same. Does that track and seem to be right? Okay, how about a little bonus learning? Putting some concepts together. Remember, we've already done solving absolute value equations, so I wrote down absolute value of x equals two, which of course we know x equals two, x equals negative two, because it's two units from zero. But let's look at this graphically. I'm going to set the left-hand side of my equation, y equals absolute value, and then the right-hand side of the equation as y equals two. Let's graph those two equations. We know the first is just our parent function, vertex at zero, zero, up one over one, up one over one. So there's our parent function, y equals absolute value of x. Next, I'm gonna graph the line y equals two. Well, y equals two, that means it cuts through the y axis and all values on my line are y equals two. So there's the line y equals two. Now, what's the solution? Meaning, which points do they have in common? So look how nice this is. When the output is two, what are the possible values for x? Negative two and positive two. So another way to think about this, not just on a number line, but thinking of it in a two-dimensional plane. What a big lesson. Absolute value, B, parent function, we've got this. 